good morning, everyone. It's the last day of our Christian Life Conference. And on this last day, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18. It's also Friday. You can say it with me. Amen. It's Friday. All right. I love Fridays. All right. My favorite. Well, no, let's not get into Fridays. I, I want to thank Rachel and Justin. Thank you for singing. I want to also this morning thank Dr. Ralston. We made some music adjustments in the week, and he had to do uh, overtime duty in getting some of those changes. As we've adjusted the platform, we've even made some music changes. And so I also want to thank Phil and Ryan for playing this week, and we called them up to duty at the last moment, and they did a super job, and I, I hope you're appreciating the music this week. Uh, some of those songs we've been singing in Christ alone, the song we just sang, powerful words and powerful message. You're going to find yourself humming some of those songs and the words. Um, I can remember the last communion service at Calvary Baptist in Lansdale. Uh, we've been singing songs like that in seminary chapels. Um, and we, in our last communion service, we passed out the elements. And uh, last month as we were doing that, uh, those were the two songs, by the way, that we sang. Um, the bread was passed. We all bowed our heads and, you know, in moments of silence. I think an organ played. Then when we passed the juice around, we sang as a congregation in Christ alone. You can hear the sniffles afterwards because when you read the message or you sing, think the message of the song, and then when you're holding the reminders, it just does some real serious heart rending, doesn't it? And some powerful words. And I wanted to ask Dr. Ralston and Phil and Ryan, if you don't mind, I'm going to quit at about 22. And the reason, and for the folks back there at the, at the computer, um, what, when you hear the message this morning, this, and, and I didn't work with Dr. Ralston on picking the songs, but things have been going um, in just some of the songs we've been singing and that were picked, uh, as well as the messages, they, they go like this. And when that happens, that's a confirmation to a preacher, to me, that the Holy Spirit was in this long before from the foundations of the earth. And in Providence, some of those things came together. But when we get done, by way of an invitation song, if I can use that expression, you all know what I'm talking about. We're not going to do a public invitation of sorts. But what we're going to do is, if you don't mind coming up and leading us again and complete in thee. I don't know how we will do with the mics. We may have to just do a 30-second setup back. But do you mind playing again? And we'll sing that song as a, as a group. Do you mind doing that before we leave? It would be a good thought to walk out of here with, wouldn't it? And that's how we ought to live. We did an interview, Camden, last night on a telephone over just some things for the newspaper on what was the intention of the speaker as a hope that this conference would achieve, if you could put it in three words, that we would walk out of here thinking, complete in thee. And, and that's what I hope this semester will be. It's going to be homesickness. It's going to be struggles. It's going to be midterms. Worst time of your life. Worst time of your life. Worst time of a semester is midterms week. It's not finals, by the way. People think it's final exams week. That's only... But from a student perspective, and trust me, I've been teaching 25 years. It isn't finals because there's nothing else going on. It's just finals. Everybody dreads finals. Don't dread finals. Dread midterms, all right? It's because life is going on at half my grade or something, depending on this exam. And you'll feel like hanging it up. Don't hang it up, okay? There's so many things going on and... And you'll feel like, I didn't learn anything. You are really, 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 as you're proceeding through college, really getting smart. Okay? You're learning a lot. And um, we get to test you to find out how much. All right? Luke 18 this morning. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed preaching this week. I think speakers are going to tell me that as they'll speak and then I'll have an opportunity to either coffee with them or lunch with them or talk with them afterwards. I want to do that with them. But I think what they're going to tell me is there's just a really good spirit here at Clearwater Christian College. Um, part of what we've been doing, and as 
Mr. Fitzgerald and the others and all of you have set this up like this. There's great feedback I, as I watch you and I get... Uh, there's, there's just a good spirit. You can sense that as a, a speaker, and especially when you preach on a lot of campuses or whatnot, and you, you, feel, you can feel the Spirit of God working in hearts here. And uh, that's, that's because of you. And, and God's doing something in all of our lives. And so let's share the journey together and continue to pray for one another. And I promise as I learn names, I can't pray for you all by name, but I can pray for, I got yearbooks and I can pray by faces now. And so uh, I'm doing that. I, I promise you I'm praying for you. And uh, I've been working this week on learning faculty and staff names. And uh, that's what I'm doing because I'm praying for them. And... Um, and what we're doing, we're going to start doing as administrators for you, for you freshmen. We're printing up all of your names on a list, and we're going to chop that list into seven parts. And we're going to pray Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just so you know whether you appreciate it or not. But you're being mentioned by well over a dozen people each day in prayer. And um, you've got some real friends. They're called faculty and staff, and, and they really are praying for you. So we promise we're going to do that. Did you look in the mirror this morning? Uh-oh, did I forget to squeeze it? That's what you think when I say, did you look in a mirror? But, but all of us, as it, you feel that way. Um, I didn't have, I do that. I walked into chapel this morning, and uh, last thing I always do. Uh, one, somebody once asked me, what's, what's, What's the last thing you do before you walk into the pulpit? This was one of my pastoral interns I remember years ago. Uh, Dr. Monroe Parker used to be vice president at Bob Jones University, became the first resident president at Pillsbury Baptist Bible College in Owatonna, Minnesota. Uh, I won't tell you what he said, but he, someone else asked him, well, maybe I will. Well, they asked him, what was the last thing you did before, before you preached? And Dr. Parker was a fabulous evangelist and preacher and teacher. And um, uh, they asked him, what's the last thing you do before you walk into the pulpit, thinking that he would give some great... <laughs> he said, I make sure my zipper's up. So that, you know, <laughs> last thing I always do, though, is I walk into the bathroom to make sure, look in the mirror, just, you know, uh, you're coiffed and all of that. Um, I don't know what you see when you look in a mirror. Up until recently, I imagined hair, all right? And I really did. Uh, and I've, I've shared this with some people, but until a few years ago, I, I would do anything with hair. And if, well, one thing I won't do is wear something up here that looks like hair, okay? Because. The one I could afford is going to look like, well, the rabbit paws would still hang out, all right, if you understand what I mean. So I'm not going to get a hairpiece or anything like that. People would laugh. I'd like to grow a beard. I really would. I think I'd look distinguished at growing gray, but then I'd look my head's upside down. So I won't <laughs> attempt that either. But, but um, when I was pastoring, and actually it was in Owatonna, so Wayne Decker and some of the others would can remember, but when I first came to Owatonna as the pastor at Grace Baptist Church there, um, when I was pastoring, I, I used to grow hair here and then comb it across, had a little tufty deal doing here, you know, <laughs> the Hitler mustache up here, you know, and so it was, a, and my wife, among other things, had also picked up a degree in, in as uh, doing hair and things like that, and a manager of for a beauty shop, and so um, she would. I asked her once to trim my hair, and she said, "Honey, I'm going to cut this off." And I'm going, "I'll be bald." And her remark was, "Have you looked in a mirror lately?" You know, because I was in denial. I mean, I'm going, I'm going bald, and then, you know, and and I get those reminders. It blew really strong the other day, and so you know, I'd do that, and this thing would go, "Whoa." <laughs> I use the illustration, I'd swim in a pool and this thing's chasing me. Whoa, it's my hair. You know? So it just, she cut it off. And I was so self-conscious on an Easter Sunday morning, I couldn't preach. But what do you see when you look in a mirror? You know, and it's like, I imagine this. You know, but it, that's, you're in denial. The imagery of a mirror is used 
in James 1, verses 21 through 24, that be doers of the word, not hearers only, or you'll be like the natural man who looks in the mirror, beholds his face, and goes away. Actually, in the, the imagery there is unchanged, content in what he sees. And then goes out doing nothing. You need to see yourself as God sees you. And because of the imagery in James and other places, when I look in a mirror occasionally, I smile. Not because, man, you are good looking. No, it's when I look in the mirror, it's, it, it, that thought comes back. It's like, you just preached that or you're going to preach. God's looking at you. You're seeing this. He's looking really deep, right through the eyes, way down into the soul. Luke 18 this morning. I really do want to sing complete in these, so I'm... I'm not going to hurry through my message to get there, but we want to leave ample time. I want us to look into a powerful passage of Scripture that begins in verse 9. will take us through verse 14. Jesus in the parables. And I hope, as I mentioned yesterday, you are getting somewhat of an appreciation for the parables, the Lucan parables in particular, a body of literature that contains more parabolic information than any of the other Gospels, especially when it comes to discipling because the things are so hard for most of us to get our hands around but he says it's not hard at all it's just like this in your life and we can identify and go oh I do that all the time and he goes then you can do this in the Christian life too but as we look in Luke 18 it's getting close to the end of Jesus ministry and he's going to use a parable that is going to challenge us to see ourselves as God sees us. Look in the mirror of God's Word and see yourself. This morning when we walk out of that chapel, and by the way, one last announcement. When you walk out, don't go out this door, go out that door because there's the petition over there. Sign it. So have your, don't put your pen away. At when we're all done, complete in thee, do this, and then sign the petition, of course. But before we do that, you're going to walk them out, you're going to hit the sidewalk, and you're going to be one of two people throughout the day, throughout the weekend. So you look in the mirror of God's Word and let God look back at you. Verses 11 and 12, you will be one, someone perfectly content with self, or we'll see in verses 13 and 14, number two, someone completely reliant upon God. As I look at this proposition that you ought to see yourself as God sees you, you may find yourself, verses 11 and 12, background being 9 and 10, but you might see yourself, first of all, as someone perfectly content with self. I begin in verse 9. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, let me stop you for a moment. The introductory verse of this that Luke records here before he even gets to this parable is wide in scope. It says, he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. He does not pinpoint a specific group. doesn't say, this is the way the Pharisees were. He doesn't do that. Because they weren't. By the way, not all Pharisees. When you hear the word Pharisees, you and I connote images in our minds now. But I, a lot of that is wrong imagery. Because not all Pharisees were the way you imagine. You have Nicodemus. You have Joseph of Arimathea who gave his gravesite for Jesus. There were some righteous Pharisees. But admittedly, many of them displayed self-righteousness and arrogance toward others. But so do many Christians. But as we look in verse 10, it begins, Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Jesus now picks the two people to illustrate a point. He picks the two people of the day that could not have been at more opposite ends of a social spectrum. Pharisees. Can I tell you a little bit about them for just a moment? You and I know them as the religious leaders, orthodox, and you and I will always then immediately somehow put the word legalist or what after that. 
The Pharisees began in the mid-2nd century B.C., just a little less than 200 years before Christ came to earth. You won't see Pharisees ever recorded in the Old Testament. That's because the Old Testament was closed around 440 years before Christ in that realm. But about halfway between the closure of the Old Testament and the birth of Christ, then came forth this group that descended from a group whose purpose was to reform how Judaism was being practiced. The purpose of the Pharisees in this reform movement was to take the law of Moses as it had been encoded in the Pentateuch, and then the word is contextualize it, put it into context. In other words, what does the law of Moses, recorded when Moses lived around 1490, or so about 1500 years before Christ, what does the law of Moses now look like? in what you and I would call the year 170, 150 B.C. How do we now live this when we may not have a temple to worship? What would be the proper interpretation of the law of God for us now? Kind of the same way of saying, so how does the New Testament then interpret for us here in America now? Very same thing that's called contextualization. Not always an ugly word. That's what they did. And the goal was so that a Jew could live righteously. They did not use, in their language, the word saved or unsaved, because just being a Jew in their mind automatically meant you were different from a Gentile. You were automatically in the kingdom of God. You understand what I'm saying? They just knew as a Jew, I am one of the promised ones. But how do I know that I am right with God, because some of our fathers weren't, okay, or not right with God? So they wrote out all these laws that as I do them, I can then works righteousness measure. Eventually, if you think about how that carried down after 175 years, that it became just simply about doing this and doing that. The Pharisees. And they followed and obeyed the rules for living honestly, upholding the standards. And let me just say this. We would, the very same type of thing today would have had the same impact as, for instance, the reformers in the Reformation era 400 years ago. In many of our minds, they're kind of like heroes. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is how the Jews looked at the Pharisees. They were the athletes of the day. They were the heroes. They were the ones that they have the television shows or you write People magazine about. They were. They were the public image of what all of us aspire to be. On the other end of the social spectrum, you had this group of people who were Jews. And by the way, the Pharisees did two things. One... They encoded, then, the law contextually. Two, they led a nationalistic movement against Rome. As you descend out of the Hasmonean dynasty, you were always against those who were trying to take charge over us. Well, the worst citizen Jew would have been someone who sold out to Rome. He was a Jew, and he actually worked for the Republic. And what he did was the Romans allowed some form, degree of self-governing, or better yet, self-taxation. All they asked of the state of Florida in the Union is, okay, Florida, from you... The federal government wants $34 billion in taxation. Let's pick a number. I could be way off, but I'm picking a number. So what we're going to do is we're going to find us 3,400, and then we'll break it down, how each one of these men must then collect 10,000, 100,000, however much money we want. Now that those tax collectors 
can collect it in ways that they can devise. And that's what they did. They were extorting, taxing, and they would put tax on the number of wagon wheels you had. And if you want to get on this road, we'll charge you on the toll. But it won't be a dollar or 75 cents between tolls. One of them might say, this week I've decided I'm running a little behind in my toll taking. 34, 25, 10 to, I can't afford to pay that. Then I'll take your wagon. And that's what they did. And they became known as publicans. Kind of a despised occupation. To be called a publican. You and I can't even... But by the way, whenever you read the term publican in Scripture, it always says Jesus ate with publicans and sinners. How would you like to be a plumber and sinner? Okay. Dentist and sinner. Computer technician and sinner. Well, and, and you know what I'm thinking? Seminary professor, college professor, and sinner. It's like, I don't want to be one of them. You understand what I'm saying? You and I can't even relate to that kind of thinking. But when you said publican, the word what came right alongside with it. That's how despised they were. Now, as we look in this passage of Scripture, then, Jesus picks the two people of the day as opposite ends of the spectrum. And here's what we have. The righteous hero. Very quickly, watch as we look in verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. There's nothing wrong with this man's actions, by the way. Jesus doesn't condemn them, nor did he of the Pharisees as he spoke to them in Matthew 23. Only their attitude. Why? Because this man, this Pharisee, is perfectly content with himself, which means, let me point out three thoughts real quickly. He is, number one, as we look in verse 11, self-centered. At 9 o'clock in the morning, one of six times during the day, this is the 9 o'clock hour, he is going up to the temple to pray. And as he prays, it says, he prays, notice verse 11, he stood and prayed thus with himself. The word with can be translated to or by. I believe by might be the best interpretation. It also can be the word translated about. And many commentators say he prayed about himself, which fits. He is self-centered because he dwells on himself. Four times the pronoun, actually five, the pronoun I occurs. He is praying about himself with emphasis about what is blessed in his life by God. But notice, he is not only self-centered, he is self-righteous. For it says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. But by the way, as he begins the prayer, it begins God. His approach to God, it is such that God, God, just, it's good to let you talk with me today, God. Or I'm going to talk to you about me. He's self-righteous in the sense of the nature of his prayer, for he says, I thank. Now, once in that prayer, does Jesus emphasize at all a sense that this man feels guiltiness? His prayer just begins, I thank, about himself. No confession of sin, no petitioning, which takes you further in his self-righteousness, in his approach and in the nature of his prayer, but in the attitude toward others. Because what he does is he compares. The thing is driven about comparison. And he compares himself with the religious standards of the day, for he keeps the standards and he talks about that. But you know what? He goes on to compare himself with others. He feels disdain. If we judge ourselves among ourselves, Scripture says we or compare ourselves among ourselves. First Corinthians says that we are not wise. This man, I am not like others. One of the most deadly things you can do, you can do as a student here, is be happy and content that I'm not like him, her. By the way, I ought to be honest. I ought to be righteous. I ought to keep the times. I ought to do this not so I don't get the merits, because then I have met the standard. I am better than. 
it ought not to be outward standard. Listen to me, this is important. You need to be driven by an inner compunction of the Holy Spirit. Keeping the rules and keeping the regulations will keep you in school. You understand what I'm saying? Listen to me. It ain't doing nothing for your walk with God. Your walk with God comes from a heart that says, I want to do it because this is the right thing. Amen? It ought to come from that. It's just the right thing to do. Please, please become spiritual in that sense that I do the right thing because it's the what? Right thing. Not the right thing because of a rule book, but the right thing because it's the right thing. It honors God. And I want to do it because I want to be a person of character for Him. Because the only Bible, when you, and, and listen, when you get out of here, you'll have a degree, but it'll have been an opportunity for four or five years to exercise your character. And when you get out of here, the only Bible most people are ever going to read is the Bible between these two covers. It's going to be your character. That's it. And that's the most important thing. This man had a character that was completely content with self, so much that he reached a self-confidence. It says, I fast twice in a week. They only had to fast one day, one day out of the year. One day, Day of Atonement. That's all that God asked of them. He fasts twice a week. And I pay tithes, he goes on to say, of all that I possess. They only, according to the law, had to tithe on three commodities. Grain, oil, and wine. That was it. And he's tithes of everything. This man, and they all knew it, is highly commendable. He has gotten no, she has gotten no demerit. They have done everything. But something's amiss that will only show itself later, perhaps, in a broken marriage. Because way back there, real character wasn't built. Okay? They did everything by the numbers, but the numbers alone meant nothing. Something was missing. And that was the heart. Whereas another man, and let me run through this and quit verses 13 and 14. Here comes a publican, standing afar off. The publican, as you look at him recognized his personal sinfulness in the fact that he is so conscious of his own guilt that he stood in a humble spirit afar off in the court of the Gentiles with a broken spirit. It says here in verse 13, would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, conscious of the fact that I can't look in the mirror because God will look back. You ever had a dream about going to heaven? Not charismatic or anything, but it actually woke me up. It's like, I remember years ago, just being a baby crush, and I dreamt that, what it be like. And I actually had a dream like that. And I just remember, it's like, oh, whew, glad it was a dream. Because I couldn't even lift my head when I got there. It's like, I felt so cotton picking dirty. That's how this man felt. With a broken spirit and a contrite spirit, only women would do that. But here's a man, and they all knew he is acting so different from a man who would boast of himself. Because he was conscious of a need. God be merciful. God propitiate. It's a beautiful word. Sometimes we'll talk about the different word. Propitiate me. Turn thy wrath away from me, the sinner. Not a, but the sinner. God says, finally, this man went away. We use the word justified, but it literally is the word vindicated. In the sight of God. This one went away. Vindicated. Right in the way he lives. Complete in thee. Can we set up the microphones and we sing this? We have a couple of moments. And gentlemen, if you don't mind grabbing that. In Jesus Christ. And by the way, complete in thee. Do you know what that means? There is no 
righteousness in ourselves. Say this verse aloud with me. All my works of righteousness are as what? Because we are what? Complete in Him. And when God looks at you and me today, praise God, He sees us robed in the righteousness of Jesus. Do you live like that? I hope today it's all about Him. If it's not, we are too self-focused. Let's have a heart that realizes it's all because of Him or complete in Him. This is our closing prayer.